passion Feel the change in the air For the ground is dry But the clouds are overhead When I'm a-singing again in the grave now and dance like you were young you did not have to live in chains now there's a key within your song so leave the past where it belongs child and take a leap into the light come find Just me and you. Just good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to church. So good to see everyone. Let's stand as we enter into the Lord's presence this morning. Amen. I'm going to read Psalm 100. It says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord.
Father, we come before you with thanksgiving, God, on our lips this morning, with gratitude in our hearts, God, thanking you for your love and your mercy that is never ending, God, and never fails us, it never gives up on us, Lord, we thank you for who you are, Father, we thank you for your love that was so great that you would send your son to die for us, Lord. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice this morning. Father, we ask that you would move in this place, that you would move hearts, God, that you would move minds, God, 
tremble at his voice. Oh, how great his arms.
Amen, amen. Just take a moment and tell him how much you're thankful. If you're thankful for what he did on that cross, just take a moment and let him know. Jesus, we love you this morning, God. God, we thank you for your presence that's here. God, your word says we're two or three are gathered. You are in the midst, oh God. So we know that you are here, Father, and that you are moving, God, to set people free this morning, Jesus. I thank you, God, for your spirit that's here, oh God. I thank you, Lord, for every life that is here, God, for every person that came today, oh God. You know, oh God, what they're needing, God. So I lift up, God. Every prayer request to you, God, that's spoken and unspoken this morning. God, every person, oh God, that came in here struggling, oh God, that came in here battling, oh God, whether, God, they are dealing with fear, oh God, or hopelessness, God, depression, oh God, whatever it is, oh God, I bind every chain of the enemy this morning in Jesus' name, oh God, and I loose your people, oh God. And Father, we look to you this morning, oh God. We look to you for our help, oh God. And we worship you this morning, Jesus. There's no one like you, God. So I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this service, God. I thank you, God, for the work that you started, Father, that you are so faithful to finish, Jesus. God, we look to you this morning, God. Your word says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills, O God. From whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth this morning. So, Jesus, we turn to you, God. We turn to you this morning, God, for everything, oh God, all our needs, Father. Your word says that you will meet all our needs, Father, according to your riches and your glory, Jesus. So, God, I pray for every person here that feels burdened, oh God, that feels weary, oh God. God, your word says, come to me all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. So, Father, we turn to you, God. We find refuge in your arms today, Jesus. So I thank you, God, for what you're doing in this service, God. And God, we just give you permission, oh God, to move this morning, God, that we would step out of the way, God, that we would humble ourselves before you today, Jesus. There's no one like you, Jehovah. And we worship you, God, and I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, God. God, just bless this service. God, I even pray over Pastor Paul this morning, God, as he brings the word, Father, that the word will go forth with power and authority this morning, God. God, that the word, oh God, would fall on fertile ground, oh God. That the word, oh God, would pierce, oh God, our hearts this morning, Jesus. So God, we thank you, God, and we are expectant of what you're doing, God. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. I just want to thank you guys for joining us today. Welcome to our 10 a.m. service. Um, first and foremost, do we have any uh, first-time guests joining us? Anybody who decided to stop in for the first time? Amen. It's good to see you, brother. Um, real quick, so for our first-time guests, if you guys would look in front of you, we have a Connect card. If you guys would be willing to fill that out, give us a little bit of information. Um, you could drop that in the front. We'll have a gift for you. And then after service, if you guys would like, please come see Pastor and Sister Kristen. Um, just connect, and even after service, please join us downstairs. We have fellowship downstairs in the fellowship hall, bagels and coffee and all that good stuff, amen? Um, secondly, we are a church that believes in prayer, amen? Um, we have a prayer team here that prays very diligently, very intently. So with that being said, on the back of your chairs, there are prayer cards. So whatever the need is, big or small, um, we ask that you fill it out, drop it in our prayer box, and our prayer team will get on it, amen? And uh, not too many announcements today. Um, what I would encourage you guys to do, that everything we have going on during the week, to please go in our church center app. Everything could be found there. Everything is neat, organized, really easy to, um, to navigate. So again, for all the things that we have going on this week, I just ask that you go in our church center app again. Check our calendar. Stay up to date with all those good things. Amen. And so real quick, um, I just want to kind of welcome Brooklyn Teen Challenge today. It's great to have you guys here. Love to have you guys. So they have a, a special service plan for us today. So with that being said, I don't want to waste any time. So we're going to do things a little different today. We're actually going to pick up the tithes and the offerings right now, kind of get it out the way, get it done. So I'm just going to ask my ushers to come forward right now, and um, we're just going to prepare to pick up the tithes and the offerings. Amen. So real quick, um, Mark chapter 12, verse, starting at verse 41. It goes like this. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts, then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called to his disciples and said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has given more than all others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Amen. 
And as I was reading that, the Lord reminded me about something just so simple but so important in our giving, amen? And you guys might ask what that may be. But we see the story here as Jesus is sitting down, he's watching the people at the temple just give their, their tithes, gives um, what they owe, basically. And then this woman really stands out to him, right? And I was thinking about it, and I was like, wow, God, you really wanted to call this lady out above everybody else. And it clicked to me that when Jesus was sitting there, that though there were so many people giving large amounts, that didn't matter to him. Because Jesus saw right through that. Jesus, when he saw this woman, he wasn't looking at the amount that she gave. He was looking at her heart. Amen. So we need to remember that when we're giving, the amount doesn't matter. Jesus looks at the inward, not the outward. Amen. And so I had to remind myself that sometimes when it's hard to give, that I need to posture myself in a place of sacrifice the same way this woman did. Amen. That she didn't have a lot. She gave all that she had. And even the people that had a lot, they were giving, but there was no sacrifice that came out of that. Their heart was not in a place of sacrifice or obedience. They were just doing it to doing it, whether it was out of being seen or out of religion. But this woman came knowing that this is all that she had, and she gave it all. And Jesus said she has given more than anybody has ever given. Amen? And Paul even writes that each man... What he has decided to give in his heart should give not under compulsion, not reluctantly, but God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. So when we give this morning, don't worry about the amount. Don't worry about whether it's the 10%, whether it's enough. God doesn't care about the exact number. God cares about where your heart is at this morning. Amen. So I encourage you today as uh, you prepare to give to just really posture your heart in a way that doesn't matter what the amount is. It doesn't matter what the number is, whether it's a dollar, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Just posture your heart this morning and be obedient to the Lord. Amen. So if we could just bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity, God, to sow into your kingdom, God, to just... Lord, to just further what you're doing, God. So I pray over this tithe, oh God, and over this offering, God, that you, God, would multiply it, Jesus, that you would use it, God, for your own good, Father, to further your kingdom, God, to reach souls, Father, and to just do what it is that needs to be done, Lord. God, I pray for every person, oh God, that's giving today, God, that you would bless them, oh God, that you would just increase them, Father, and even those, God, who don't have anything to give today or not enough in their eyes, Father, that you would continue, Lord, to just, God, give them faith, oh God, to trust you, Lord, that when they give, that you will take care of them, Father, that you know, oh God, what they need, oh Lord, even before they speak it, Father, so help us to remember that, God, and just to be obedient, God, and to even be in a place of sacrifice this morning, Jesus. So, Lord, we thank you, God, and again, Lord, just continue to do what you're doing in this service, Father, have your way, and we thank you, God, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may come forward and give. Amen. So at this time, we're going to all stand and greet each other, and we're going to dismiss for Compass Kids. Thank you, guys.
Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a shout of praise this morning as you're finding your seats. Oh, come on, how many of you are thankful you made it to the house of the Lord this morning? Not quite as many as last Sunday. Interesting, right? Bunch of sinners we are, right? Amen. The faithful faithful here. Well, you guys are in for such a treat this morning, and not because I'm not speaking and you guys can get a week off from me, but uh, we have our family here today uh, from Brooklyn. Um, you guys all know how important and special Teen Challenge is to me. In fact, I'm here today because of the ministry of Teen Challenge. 20... Boy, almost 29, that's crazy to say. 29 years ago, I walked through the doors of Teen Challenge, broken, strung out on drugs, alcohol, hopeless. Um, really didn't think my life would ever matter or turn into anything but God. Amen. And uh, so here we have today trophies of God's goodness and grace and God's redeeming power. So... Um, I want us this morning to just give a really just a warm uh, welcome to Brooklyn Teen Challenge and our brother Mitch, who is going to be coming um, uh, with the choir. And of course, we want to recognize uh, the man in charge. He's the man in charge, but he's the second man in charge, Pastor Paul Burke and his beautiful wife, Ashley. Ash, you stand, Paul. Come on, let's honor these, this power couple. Amen. I had the honor of serving alongside these two for 10 years uh, in Teen Challenge before the Lord led us here. So uh, their friendship, their, uh, just who they are, the men and women of God that they are, uh, men of integrity, women of integrity, uh, they lead this ministry with excellence, and uh, we're blessed to have them here today. So Brother Mitch, love you, brother. This man is such a uh, powerhouse, and, and so I'm going to give the mic to him, and you're going to be blessed uh, as our men come and they uh, sing and they share some testimonies of what God is doing. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. First, I just want to thank you, Pastor Chris and church family for having us here today. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. And it's a blessing to come and worship with you and sing songs unto the Lord. Share testimonies of God's amazing grace and mercy. And let you see how powerfully God is at work through the ministry of Teen Challenge. I was reading Psalm 92 this morning, and it's a psalm for the Sabbath. Verse 1 reads, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. David is thanking God for taking him through all the things that he took him through and celebrating the things that God has done in his life. Church, we're not here today just to receive, but to give God praise for all the things that he has brought us all the way through. Amen? Amen. Somebody didn't wake up today, but you did. Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, I got reason to give God praise today. Can we stand to our feet? Yes. Let's give a heartfelt praise offering unto the Lord right now. Come on. Y'all are playing. I need somebody to give praise to the Lord that's been through something. Got reason in here to give them praise this morning. Bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. My name is Mitchell Cameron. I'm a graduate of Teen Challenge, and I'm also enrolled in Bible College. I got reason to give God praise this morning. For those of you that are unfamiliar with our ministry, we're a 12-month faith-based drug and alcohol recovery center, but we're much more than that. We're a discipleship program because we believe in the healing power of Jesus Christ. And because we have the Jesus factor, we have the highest success rate of any drug and alcohol program in the world. Amen. That's something to get excited about, church. 
We were started in 1958 by a small town preacher named David Wilkerson from Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. He felt the call of God on his life to go into New York City and minister to seven gang members who were on trial for murder. During his time in New York City, he witnessed several young men and women who were struggling in addiction and in the gang life. And he began to evangelize in the streets of New York. And one day he encountered Nicky Cruz, who at that time was the leader of one of the most dangerous gangs in New York City. And when he first tried to minister to him, Nicky spit in his face, pulled out a switchblade and said, I'll cut you in a thousand pieces. Pastor Wilkerson said, go ahead, Nicky. Each piece will cry out, Jesus loves you. See, Nicky wasn't used to someone responding to his violence in that way. And the spirit of the Lord began to grab a hold of his heart. Pastor Wilkerson held rallies in the streets of New York. And during one of the last rallies that he held, Nicky Cruz and several of his gang brothers came forward at the altar call. And they surrendered their lives to the lordship of Jesus Christ. It was a miracle, church. Yeah. But Pastor Wilkerson knew that... It wasn't enough just to minister to him in the streets. He needed a place to bring them back to so he could disciple them. And that's when he bought the first ever Teen Challenge home in 1960 on 416 Clinton Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. And it's still our home today. And miracle after miracle took place there. And based off that humble beginning, we now have over 240 centers across the US and over 1,400 centers worldwide. Glory to God. And the same miracles that were taking place in 1960 are the same miracles that are taking place all around the world at Teen Challenges where Jesus Christ is being preached and captives are being set free. What I have here is an abbreviated version of The Cross and the Switchblade. It was a best-selling book, sold over 15 million copies. It's the history and birth of Teen Challenge. And we want to give every one of you one of these free. All we ask is that you sign up for our mailing list. And all that is is an extra blessing. You'll receive an encouraging word from our executive director, Reverend Paul Burke. You'll get testimonies of success stories that have come through our program. And you'll get updates, you know, on what's going on in our ministry from month to month. What I have here is one of our beautiful handcrafted cutting boards made by men in our ministry. Now, not only would you make a positive impact in the fight against addiction today by picking one of these up, but you'd make a beautiful statement in your kitchen too, right? I mean, this is beautiful. Yeah. We know what the Word of God says, right? You reap what you sow. And I believe in faith. If you pick one of these up and you sow a seed of love into our ministry today, you're going to reap a harvest of God's miracle-working breakthrough power that takes place every day at Teen Challenge. this, I believe, to be the most important thing that I'm going to present to you this morning. This is all the information you need to get into our program. I want everyone here to pick up at least five of these on their way out. Put them in your glove box in your car. Put them in your desk drawer at work. Put them in your kitchen. You never know. It could be a family member. It could be a friend, a co-worker. It could be a stranger you're seeing as you're driving down the road one day. You feel the Spirit of the Lord leading you to help them. You could put one of these in their hands and they can find their way to a place where Jesus Christ has been setting captives free for 66 years. So how many of these are you going to pick up? Five. Amen. At this time, I'd like to call up the Brooklyn Adult and Teen Challenge Choir. Who's ready for some testimonies? Yeah. At this time, I want to ask Brother Keith to come up and share his testimony of what God's doing in his life. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. My name is Keith Rodriguez. I um, was born in Manhattan Hospital, raised in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I grew up in uh, the street of Crescent uh, by Fulton, the J Train. Um, 
my mom was a single mom. I have two little brothers, and uh, I suffered from the loss of my mom being murdered when I was 10 years old, and that led me and my brothers into addiction. I used to pick up buds of cigarettes off the floor and started smoking weed at a young age, and that led to even harder drugs, but it's not about the drugs. It's not about my past. It's about what God you know, pulled me out of, and he set my feet on a solid rock. And uh, I, remember, I remember the time that, uh, you know, growing up, being forced to go to church because, you know, my grandparents took me and my brothers in because we didn't have nowhere to go. And I know that, you know, my grandfather and my grandmother were ministers. You know, my grandfather, Calvin Hunt, was a gospel artist. And I thank God for, for him, you know, raising me up to, to, to be a, a, you know, a, a man of God. And um, I was going to church, but I never really, like, knew who God was. I had an idea of God and, you know, Sunday school and Tuesday night prayers and things like that. But I, know, I was never really, you know, into the word and into God, you know. And um, I just remember, like, like, why am I doing this? But I was in the youth choir when I was, like, 16. I, I was in a dance team in my church. And, you know, God was using me, but I didn't know what I, like, what I was doing. I was just, I like to dance and I just like to sing, I guess. But, um, but God is good. Um, I'm thankful that, you know, I'm here. Teen Challenge is a, a wonderful program. And I got a bunch of beautiful brothers behind me, man. That, you know, this is a beautiful discipleship program. And this, this ministry has blessed my life. I've been here before, but I wasn't really feeling it in 2021. And I winded up leaving, you know. But I know God, he has a plan for my life. And, um... I was actually fundraising because we, we fundraise a lot, and I know I was on a box with one of the graduates. We was in Connecticut in front of a, in front of a um, Walmart, and uh, uh, some lady came out, and I never met her a day in my life, and she, she came out, and she was like, I just want to tell you guys that Jesus really loves you guys, and um, she was asking me, she was like, do you play basketball? And I was like, yeah, I play basketball. Why? She was like, the Holy Spirit is telling me that one day that he walked you to the park and watched you play basketball by yourself. And I remember the day that my mom got murdered, I had asked her if I could go to the park and she was in the room arguing with her boyfriend and she said no. And I, something led me, like I heard a still voice in my head and I snuck out the house and I went to the park and I played basketball. And I remember that when the lady told me that that was God that walked me to the park and he watched me play basketball and I lifted my hands up and I started praising God for just protecting me and keeping his hand on my life. And that's the reason why I'm here today, still alive. And the verse that I stand on is James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when, bro when trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has the chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. Amen. Good job, buddy. Good job. Who was blessed by that testimony? Hey Amen. Would you please stand to your feet and worship with us this morning?
Ready for another testimony? Yeah. This brother here is uh, very special in my heart, and I'm so excited to see what God's going to do in this young man's life. I'd like to call up Brother Noel to come share his testimony. How y'all doing? My name is Noel. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and I'm gonna just get to us, just get to it. But when I was 13, my first substance use was I was smoking marijuana, and from weed it went to codeine, and to, it just kept going, graduating from drug to drug. And growing up, I had two disability, two parents with disabilities, so but they tried their best with me. So, but I just like I just went my own route due to the environment I was in. I started gang banging hanging out with the wrong crowd, doing the wrong things into every wrong thing that wasn't of God. And from there, my life just kept going down. And due to like a drug that I had did, I had like a bad trip and my family had put me in like a, a mental institution. And I was in there for three, three months. And while I was in there, I had a Bible and I started to pray and when I started, to, I just asked God to just restore my, my mind and just to heal my mind. And 
And while I was in there, I was able to make a phone call and I got reconnected to my dad's side of the family. And when they took me out and they recommended Teen Challenge because one of the family in my family had went through the program before. So they brought me Teen Challenge and Teen Challenge took me in and it discipled me. And I ended up getting baptized. <laughs> God's just been working on me ever since. I'm now eight months clean. And I'm turning 18 this month, 26. So I just I thank God for Team Challenge. And I think I thank God for just brothers that I have to encourage me and lift me up and just guide me on the path that I should go on. And I just I'm grateful and the scripture I stand on is Proverbs 3, 5, 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him, and you'll make your path straight. Thank you, church. Hallelujah. Would you please stand to your feet one more time and worship with this last song?
Let's give it up for the Brooklyn and Dalton Teen Challenge Choir. You may be seated. So there's one thing left that I want to speak on before I call up Reverend Paul Burke, and it's Project 365. It's a way that you can sponsor one of these gentlemen on the choir today for a dollar a day sponsorship. So it's as simple as buying a cup of coffee, right? And it's very special to my heart because I was sponsored when I came through the program by the Manzo family. And what I didn't share with you in the beginning is I spent 23 years of my life as a gang member. I was arrested for the first time when I was 10 years old for carrying a concealed firearm. I spent most of my childhood in the juvenile detention centers due to gang violence. Uh, I didn't have any high school years. And as an adult, I was sent to the Florida State Prison four times. I was truly chained. I was raised in an environment much different than a lot of people. My father is the president currently right now as of an outlaw motorcycle club. And, uh, but guys, you know, giving me opportunities to pray for them. And um, I believe, I believe, because if he can do it for me, he can do it for my father. The world looked at me as there was no way, no hope for me. I was a lost cause. All I'd ever be was a gang member and an arch criminal. But how many in here know that our God's a way maker and a miracle worker? By God's grace, in July of 2019, I found my way to Teen Challenge by way of the Manzo family. And I surrendered my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And it's the greatest decision that I've ever made. All these men here have amazing testimonies. Well, that's what takes place at Teen Challenge. Right? From junk to jewels. From trash to treasure. Waste to wonder. From broken to blessed. Amen? Think about it. A dollar a day sponsorship. Simple as a cup of coffee. Do I have any 7-Eleven coffee drinkers in the house? I see a show of hands. Amen. You could sponsor one of these gentlemen up here today on this choir. Are there any Dunkin' Donuts coffee drinkers in the house? Can I see your hands? Hallelujah. You could sponsor two to three members of this choir today. And by any chance, are there any Starbucks coffee drinkers in the house? Praise the Lord. You can sponsor the entire choir today. But if you're interested in signing up, please come see me after the service. And at this time, I have the privilege to call up our executive director, yeah. Reverend Paul Burke. Get ready to hear from heaven. Praise the Lord. What, what an honor it is to be here today. What a, what a great job from the choir. Amazing. Mitch, great job. Thank you, sir. You know, I'm overwhelmed with emotion uh, this morning as, as I was listening to the testimonies. You know, I've been part of the Ministry of Teen Challenge. It'll be 17 years here uh, in September, so... Uh, not only do I have my own testimony and my wife has her testimony, but we've been listening to testimonies for 17 years and I still uh, get welled up with emotion uh, when I see young men and young women uh, coming uh, to know Jesus through the ministry of Teen Challenge. And the one thing uh, that, I, that I always think is there's so much more work to do and we got to do better. We got to do better. There's so many broken people. Uh, there's a generation right now that is being killed off from fentanyl. There's areas of, of, of New York City and, and every major city and state in our country where there's actually blocks that are literally filled with what they call zombies. And these are people's sons and daughters, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers that are being killed off uh, by addiction. So there was a great need in 1958 when David Wilkerson came to the streets of New York, but that, that need has actually grown. And uh, that's why it's an honor and privilege for me and my wife to serve this wonderful, wonderful ministry. Uh, and we're just so blessed to be here, thankful to Compass Church, Pastor Chris and Kristen, uh, for their continued support and love for us. Uh, 
It, for us, it goes beyond ministry. Uh, we're friends, close friends, and even family. Uh, so it's, it's a privilege to be here, Pastor Chris, and so thankful for uh, the, the open doors here at Compass for us. Much appreciated. Well, I will going to be sharing a word with you today. The Lord has kind of really switched gears for me uh, over the last couple of days from what I originally planned on being my mission for today, my assignment, but I'd rather do what the Lord wants than what I want. Amen, right? So we're going to go to John chapter 11, if we could. We'll start off. I'll be sharing a word uh, from verse 1 through 44, but I will not be reading all those verses, so no, don't worry. I won't make you hanging on with me for all that much time. Um, but I really want to minister to those today that find themselves in a place uh, of struggle, in a place of waiting, in a place, uh, in a middle place where you have a promise and you have a word, uh, but you're not seeing that come to pass as quickly as you would like to. That's really what I want to focus on today, and I'm going to be using a particular portion of Scripture. Um, most people know uh, the story of Lazarus and how Jesus raised him from the dead, so my assignment today is going to be out of that portion of Scripture, if you could. I'll start with verse 38, I will read through 44, and then we will move on. If you could. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead Four days. So this was actually a stinky situation. <laughs> so I've come to minister to those that find themselves in stinky situations. <laughs> Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. The title of my message is, you can count on it. If I had a subtitle, it would be when he calls your name. Let us pray. Father, it is in the name of Jesus that we come before you, Lord, humbly weak and broken, asking, Lord, that in this bit of time that your word be, de be declared in, in truth, power, and authority, Lord. Father, I pray that you take my weakness and you make me strong. I pray, Lord, that my mind would be, would be so connected to your spirit that it would be your mind in my, in my mouth, Lord. I pray that my tongue would be ready like a writer, Lord God, to speak your word and declare your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here we are in the point of the scriptures where it speaks of one of Jesus' most magnificent and powerful miracles. See, Jesus did many miracles and many healings throughout the Gospels. He was also considered the greatest teacher of all time. There are many documents that speak of the great wonders that Jesus did during his life. But I think that this happens to be one of the greatest miracles that are, that are pictured in Scripture. You see, many of the miracles of Jesus were documented in all four of the Gospels' accounts. 
This particular one is unique to the book of John. Many believe because Peter isn't mentioned in this portion of Scripture and much of the Gospels are surrounded the ministry of Peter. But you see, this is one of the most spectacular things that Jesus had done and was documented in the Holy Scriptures. And I want to go a little bit earlier in this chapter to where this all begins, to lay a background of the story. In verse 1 of the same chapter, it says, A certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister was Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, the one you love is sick. And this is very significant. Scripture declares that Jesus loved this man. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness will not end on, in the death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard he was sick, he stayed two more days at the place he was doesn't seem like he was in much of a rush. Didn't seem like his actions showed the love that he had in his heart for these particular people. In fact, if I was to look at this, I would think that maybe Jesus didn't care about this person. Maybe it looked like he wasn't concerned about the feelings or the life of this particular family. But we know as Scripture documents, it says that Jesus... Love them. The summary of this passage, the story of Lazarus, is described from verse 1 through 44. And it, it shows us that Jesus has the power over life and death. Significantly, Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha were close friends of Jesus. Throughout the Gospels, they are together. Jesus learns that Lazarus of Bethany is gravely ill and his sisters require his presence and assistance. Jesus delays from visiting him for two days knowing full well that he can pre perform a miracle to restore Lazarus to life. Disciples warn Jesus about going back to Judea as we know that in Judea the Pharisees were looking to kill Jesus. So Jesus intends to travel to Bethany and tells his disciples that Lazarus' sickness won't end in death. He knows that Lazarus' illness and death happened for the glory of God. And that the Son of God would be glorified through this. Upon seeing Lazarus lying dead in the tomb, Jesus wept. Remember, he loved Lazarus. Then Jesus raises his friends from the death by calling out in a voice, saying, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus emerges from this tomb. But he's wearing grave clothes. You see, the central message of this story that's contained here is about this one quote out of John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus says this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do we believe this this morning? Yes. See, the center point of all scripture is Jesus. See, the Old Testament was looking forward to Jesus. The Gospels were looking at Jesus. And the epistles and the entirety of the New Testament are pointing back to Jesus. See, he is magnificent. He is wonderful and marvelous. He is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. He is the bread of life. He is the light of this world. There was never anyone like him before him, and there'll never be anyone like after him. See, he was separate all by himself. He was consecrated, anointed, and set apart all by himself. Not like any other man that ever lived or walked this earth. 
And see, because of this, he is worthy of all praise and all honor. See, he is Jesus. He is wonderful. He is our Lord and he is our Savior. He is our God. He is our creator. And he is our friend. See, every healing and every sign and wonder was to prove this very fact. That God has authority over life and death. That there is no power that is outside of his power. There is no might outside of his might. He is, has sovereignty over all things. Aren't you glad about that today? That we don't cry out and praise a dead God, but we sing these songs of adoration and praise to an ever-powerful, everlasting, King of glory, wonderful Savior. That's the God that we pray to. That's the God that we worship, and that's the God that we sing to today. That's what this entire portion of Scripture is about. That's what the entirety of the Bible is about. Although good things come from the Lord and the gospel is the good news and, 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 and we are saved from death, hell, and the grave. The entirety of this Bible was to point to Jesus Christ. But there are subplots working here. Aren't you glad that the word of God is manifold? That's why it's, it's living, it's alive. There is no circumstance and no situation that you will ever face in your life that the scriptures do not talk about. There is no principle that you will ever need in life that you will not find in the Holy Scriptures. You know, it's funny. I read a lot of leadership books over the last, I mean, I would probably say over the last three years, or three or four years, I've probably read 20 to 30 leadership books. Some from Christian perspectives and, 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 and spiritual perspectives and some from secular minds, business, politicians, Read all sorts of even uh, uh, army generals and all different kinds of books on leadership. And you want to know something? It's very hard to find something that isn't in the Bible. <laughs> so basically what, what the world has done oftenly is taken the very principles that are in the scriptures and twisted them around in different words and sell them in a different way. And I'm not saying that as a bad thing. I'm saying that as a good thing. That this, this word that we have been given the privilege that we have to have the written word of God. I, I, I think we take it for granted sometimes. In fact, I know we do. I know I do. This word is magnificent. And that's why there's so many subplots and whatever we need in life could be found in the Bible. And I urge you to read the scriptures. I urge you to, to listen to the, the, the word of God, whether it's preached or whether, whether it's audio Bible or whatever. Get this book in your heart, in your spirit, in your mind. It will absolutely transform your life. But there's subplots here, and that's what I really want to talk about. And it brings me to my first point. And it's out of verse 3 of this chapter. It says, Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, whom you love is sick. And that's why my first point is this. God's love is a fact that has been previously determined by the cross. See, circumstances and situations do not determine whether God loves us or not. Never. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. What does that mean? That means that good and bad happen to both people that are saved, unsaved, believers, unbelievers, acting right, doing right, living right. That God, God's love for us can never be predicated on present situations. Because the Bible declares that Jesus loved Lazarus. He loved Mary. And he loved Martha. But still being in that fact that, 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 that they were loved, they still had to watch their brother get sick. They had to watch their brother, them wait for Jesus. Has anybody ever waited for Jesus for something? Have you ever cried out to God, when are you going to come? Well, he had to watch. They had to watch their brother's health deteriorate. They had to watch him uh, breathe his last 
breath. They had to do the whole funeral procession and put them in grave clothes and wrap them up for, for death. And then place them into a grave. And I'm sure they had this nice old ceremony and this old prayer. And according to Jewish custom and law, then they had to walk away and say, Jesus never came. Jesus never showed up. When we read the scriptures, we're we're able to fast forward through some of this stuff. We really don't pick up on some of uh, the the some of the the actual the, the things that are really happening if you place yourself inside the scripture, and you place yourself inside the situation. I'm sure they even had reason to be offended. Has anyone ever been offended at God? Have you ever thought that He should have done something a little bit different? Have you ever thought that? That maybe you had a a better way of working out your present circumstance? Well, I'm sure Mary and Martha probably had some conversations. What if he would have showed? Why didn't he show? He told us he loved us. He told us he cared for us. But he didn't show. See, terrible things happen to even people that God loves. And your understanding of God's love must be revealed to you in such a way that temporary circumstances do not change your opinion about the way he feels about you. I'm going to say that again. Your understanding of God's love must be revealed to you in such a way that temporary circumstances do not change your opinion of God's love for you. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this. That's, that someone lay down his life for his friends. We know that Jesus said this before he went to the cross. But what he was saying was this. Is that there is no greater love than someone that would lay down his life. And sometimes that means the physical. And we know in actuality he laid down his life. He literally died on a bloody rugged cross 2,000 years ago for us. But we are called as believers and followers of Jesus to even now lay down our life. And sometimes it's not unto death. Lay down our life for others. You see, God's love is is a fact that previously needs to be determined by the cross. And if you think that, if if you look at anything else in your life, you're going to go back and forth about whether God loves me or not, whether or not God cares for me or not. You're going to look at why did this happen to me, and why did this person treat me this way, and why did this person leave me, and why did this person talk bad about me, and why did this person betray me. And and if you're you're not secure in the fact that regardless of what you go through on a day-to-day basis, that God's love for you is a fact. It's a done deal and it was put on full display on a bloody cross 2,000 years ago. Jesus loved Lazarus. He loved Mary. He loved Martha. But he didn't rush to their aid the way and in the timing that they thought he should. Franklin Graham says like this, no matter what the storm, no matter what storm you face, you need to know that God loves you. He has not abandoned you. C.S. Lewis said it like this, though your feelings come and go, God's love never does. Vody Bachman said, when you want to know whether Jesus loves you, do not look in your own heart, but look at the cross. I love what Jeremiah 31, 3, when he's prophesying to the nation of Israel, he said, the Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I've loved you with an everlasting love. And I'm drawing you in with kindness. See, Jesus' love was not predic- is not predicated by smooth sailing or the lack of problems. Lazarus was sick. His family was distressed. Mary and Martha, I'm sure, were anxious, maybe slightly offended at Jesus that he didn't come in a time. But guess what? Jesus loved Lazarus all the same. And I want to encourage you today that no matter what you're going through, 
I want to reiterate this, something you've probably heard a thousand times. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. I was reading a story about Corey Ten Boom. Those of you, she wrote many, a couple books, a lot of quotes. If you look online about her, she was a, a woman. She she was a, a Dutch Christian during uh, Nazi Germany's uh, reign, where they were they were they were killing off all the Jews. The Holocaust, one of the worst, if not the worst, things that ever happened in humanity. And her and her family would, uh, they would, they were, they were hiding Jewish people from the Nazi government, and uh, they wound up getting caught. And they wound up being put in a concentration camp themselves and put in a prison. And they were, uh, she was in a prison with her, with her, with her sister and. What would happen in these things, in these, in these places, in these consecration camps, is that the guards would often go into the rooms and they would beat the people there and they would rape the woman and they would do all sorts of horrific things uh, to, uh, to these ladies. And uh, Corey and her sister were, were, were locked up in, in, a, in a cell and it was a dirty place. It wasn't like jails of today. It was not, they, weren't, they were not treated like humans. And they were in this flea-ridden jail cell. And the sister would tell Corey when she would begin to complain about the situation with the fleas, she would begin to thank, thank God about the situ- the fleas. And, and Corey would say to her sister, why are you thanking God for these fleas? Why are you thanking God for this situation? And she says, because if God allowed us to be in this situation, God put us here, he's got to turn it and work it for our good. There's got to be a reason why the God loves us is allowing us to go through this. And uh, Corey hated the fleas. She hated them and she was was angry and obviously it wasn't a good situation. I'm sure she was scared and they would hear the other women being abused and different things happening. But they would never ever come in to her her cell. Later on when she was to find out why. They wouldn't come into their cell and rape them and beat them. It was because the guards knew that there was a flea issue in that particular cell. And they wouldn't go there because they didn't want to be bitten up by fleas. So sometimes in life, we have situations where we have nagging fleas. And uh, uh, situations that we're not comfortable with and things that we don't like. And we can question God about why we're going through this and why is this happening. But one thing I could tell you that no matter what you're going through, God loves you. No matter what situation you're in, it may be hard, it may be difficult, but your love is not predicated on your, your present situation. His love for you is not predicated on how you feel today. It's not, your your mood, whether you feel loved or you don't feel loved, is, is not the truth. What the truth is, is that God sent his only son into this world. Why? Because he loved us. And our, and, and our, uh, um, a picture of God's love and God's care for us only needs to be found in one place. And that is the bloody cross of Calvary. That is it. The only way that you'll be able to, sig- to go through life and keep your peace and keep your joy is if, if you don't let circumstances and situations dictate about whether God loves you or not. Because I'm going to tell you right now, no matter what you're going through, no matter where you are, no matter how you feel today, if you, if God loves you. He loves you so much that he said, his only begotten son he let his son take the wrath of our sin upon his body so that we can have eternity and be reconciled to him that's the gospel message the good news is that isn't that everything is going to be great the good news isn't that every day is going to be wonderful the good news is that we're reconciled back to the father and that we are going to spend eternity with him so this light affliction that you may be going through right now this present circumstance that you may be dealing with the pain that you're feeling in your mind in your body in your family in your finances is temporary but one thing that I know is for sure eternity is for eternity and forever is forever 
God loves you. The cross says so. The cross said so. Number two. Verse six. It says, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. No rushing here. My second point is God's timing is the only timing that exists. God's timing is the only time that exists. Lisa Brevere says this, Some, sometimes arriving too quickly is detrimental. It is dangerous to arrive without our character or maturity intact. Melody Carlson said, sometimes we must let our dreams go in order to allow God to bring them back to us in the, his way, in his timing. God's timing is the only timing that exists. He waited two more days. He wasn't in a rush. It wasn't because he had to figure it out. It wasn't because he didn't know what to do. It wasn't because he didn't love them. It's because God had a plan. And God's timing is the only timing that exists. But we do get weary, don't we? We do get tired, don't we? It is hard at times. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. Saints of God, I want to tell you today that if you're in the middle of those two to four days and you're waiting on God, I want to tell you today that there is strength made available to you. That the Holy Spirit and the Word of God has not left us as orphans. It hasn't le left us without power. It hasn't left us without a, a, a way to get through. The Bible says this, those who endure to the end. What does that mean? That means there are some things that we have to endure. There are some situations that we're going to have to persevere. There are some things that are going to take us out of our comfort zone. But the hope that we find is what will renew our strength. When we put our hope and our trust in the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen? Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. The problem is, 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 is we don't always know the proper time, Pastor Chris, and we have to trust God's sovereignty, his wisdom, that his timing is the only timing that exists. And we have to find ways to, 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 to have peace of mind while we're waiting on God. Because if God's timing was left up to us, I'm telling you, surely we would mess it up. I remember when I met Ashley in 2009, I went, I went right to my, and I didn't plan on embarrassing you today, but, babe, but it's, it's relevant. I remember I went to my pastor and I said, the Lord spoke to me. Ashley Key is going to be my wife. And he said, that's great, Paul, but not now. She's not. <laughs> he told me she wasn't ready, but I think it was really more that I wasn't ready. And we didn't get married until two, 2016. We didn't start dating until 2014. No. 13? 2013, I'm sorry. The bliss of it all, I get lost sometimes. <laughs> it, our love is so intoxicating, I forget. My point being is I really believed I heard from God. I know that I heard from God. That was 2009. Things didn't come together until two years later, but we've been married now eight, going on nine, huh? Well, four years, a few years. I meant to say a few years later. Right. I'm a preacher, not a mathematician. I meant to say a few. Did I say two? A few kind of gives you, I know it's three, but it gives me a little bit of leeway, you know? Four years. My point being is, I, I believed I heard from God. And now removed years and children and everything, I did hear from God. But the point was, just because I had the promise, 
Just because I knew God's purpose and God's plan for me, my life, for Ashley, didn't mean I didn't have to wait on him for certain things. And now by the time we did get together, I realized when I thought I was ready, I wasn't ready. And we have to trust God's timing in our life for things that he's either brought to us or didn't bring to us. Because remember, you can count on his love. He loves you. Number two, you can count on his timing. You can trust him. I'm reminded, I'm reminded of the cry of David's heart while being hunted by Saul. He says this in Psalm 13. This was written while Saul, who he had served faithfully, did nothing to harm, sought out to kill him. And the, David writes this in Psalm 13. He says, how long, Lord, will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. He keeps on asking the Lord, how long? I had a promise, Lord. I was anointed years ago to be king. I served Saul's house faithfully. I did what I was asked to do. I tended the sheep. I fought off the bears and I fought off the wolves. And, 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 I, and, and I wasn't too proud. I didn't, once you anointed me, I didn't get puffed up and think that I deserved more or something else. I did what you asked me to do. But yet I'm still crying out to you, how long will I wait? Let's look closer at David's process because remember God's timing is the only timing that matters. He was anointed to be king at an early age even though his family didn't see it. Was that rejection or was that God's timing and plan? Shows up to fight Goliath accidentally while serving his brother cheese and grains. His intentions were misjudged but he defeats Goliath anyway. Was that coincidence or God's timing? Brought into Saul's palace to serve him, Saul gets jealous and sends him into exile. Saul searches for David to have him killed. More suffering, hurt, and rejection. Is that God's plan or just happenstance? King Saul and Jonathan killed, and one of Saul's servants brings the crown right before the, the David at Gilgal. Tell me, is this starting to look like God's course of training and his timing? Do you think for a second while David was crying out to God, Lord, how long? He wasn't concerned about God's timing. Why is this happening and that happening? I was anointed king as a young teenager, and now I'm almost 30 years old, and I have not seen what you promised over my life come to pass. In fact, I've seen everything come against what, would I, what I thought was to be true. I'm sure when he was anointed king at, at uh, scholars say he was between 13, 14 years old, I'm sure when he was anointed king, he probably went back to the sheep pasture thinking a couple months you know, maybe a week or two, 15 years, over 15 years it took him before he took the throne. But when the throne was brought to him, when the crown was dropped at his feet, it was when he was running away from Saul. He was running away. He could have killed Saul, but he went the other direction. Instead of chasing what God had promised him, he chased it God. And what God promised him, chased him. So what am I trying to tell you today? That when you chase God, whatever God has for you in his timing, his way, and, and, and his method, it will get to you. You will have it. Even if he has to drop it at your feet while you're running the other way. What God has for you, God has for you. You can count on it. But God's timing is the only timing that exists. God's love is determined by the cross, not by our situations. God's timing is his timing, regardless of what we see with our eyes. It wasn't God's timing to come get Lazarus after two days. It wasn't God's timing to come get Lazarus while he was sick. It wasn't God's timing 
to make Lazarus not get sick at all. It wasn't God's timing. But when it was God's timing, you can count on God's timing. Is anyone getting encouraged today? Is anyone getting encouraged? This brings me to my third point, and I'll be closing in an hour or two or so. No, I'm just kidding. We're almost there. We're almost there. It's found in verse 4. Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. How easy is it to get caught up in the poor me or the what about me syndrome in a selfie, self-care, self-absorbed world? The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the glory that God's son may be glorified through it. Brings me to my third point, which is God is painting a big picture named his glory. God is painting a big picture named his glory. We are his masterpiece created for his glory. See, the book of Colossians says that all things were made by him and for him. We forget that. We forget that, especially in the Western church in America, that all things were made by him and for him. The world uh, doesn't revolve around you, honey. The world doesn't revolve around you. All things were made by him and for him. Because God is painting a big picture called his glory. Psalms 145, 11 through 12 says, They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom, of his kingdom, and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. It's about his kingdom. It's about his glory. That means sometimes situations are going to come. You can count on that. But you could also count on that no matter what you're going through, God loves you. The cross says so. It may not be in your timing. It may not be when you think is right. But you can count on it that God's timing is the only timing that exists. J.J. Packer said this, Our high and privileged calling is to do the will of God in the power of God for the glory of God. (laughs) Let Let me say that again. Our high and privileged calling, do I have any saints in here that are called by God, is to do the will of God in the power of God for the glory of God. But I know it's difficult to see past our pain. It's difficult to see past our struggle. I know that some days are harder than others. and Some days we don't feel like we're on top of the mountain, but we feel like we're in the valley. But 1 Peter chapter 5.10 says, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, he will perfect you, he will establish you, he will strengthen you, and he will settle you. You can count on God's love. You can count on God's timing. But you could also count on the fact that after you've suffered for a while, God will strengthen you. He will establish you and he will settle you. John Piper said the created universe is all about glory. The deepest longing of the human heart and the deepest meaning of heaven and earth are summoned by this, the glory of God. The universe was made to show it and we were made to see it and savor it. Nothing else will do which is why the world is disordered and dysfunctional as it is as it is we've exchanged the glory of god for other things god all all things were made by him and all things are for him why don't we stand as i close came to encourage you today. There's not a person under the sound of my voice that doesn't have hardships and things going on in their life. I know there's a lot of pain in this room. I know there's a lot, there's loss, there's grief, there's hurt, 
there's rejection, there's abuse, there's addiction, there's a lot of pain. There's not a lot of things you can count on, especially in this day and age. Seems like you never know what tomorrow is going to bring. Well, tomorrow is going to bring an eclipse, supposedly. <laughs> Two days ago, brought an earthquake. The Statue of Liberty was struck by lightning. What, a, what am I trying to say is life just brings uncertainties, and we really don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I think if COVID taught us anything, it taught us that there's not too much we can count on. But here's what you can count on. You can count on God's love. It was displayed on that bloody cross. You can count on God's timing, that he knows exactly what he's doing. He's not scared. He's not confused. He's not lost. He's got a plan and a purpose. The plan and the purpose is to glorify the Son in and through your life. And sometimes... It's in the middle of hard stuff. It's in the middle of difficult situations. In the middle of loss and rejection and pain and sorrow. I know that you've been through a lot. Many of you feel like you've been waiting for Jesus to fix this stinky situation. Two days have turned into four. And it all seems but lost. But you count on this. Just like he called Lazarus' name forward. He'll call your name forward. When he calls your name, it doesn't matter who didn't. When he calls your name, it doesn't matter who rejected you. When he calls your name, it doesn't matter whether you think you belong or not. When he calls your name, it doesn't matter how long you've waited. When he calls your name, nobody has anything to say about it except the one who's calling your name. Today I want to pray for you for strength to continue. Strength to believe. I'm going to ask Pastor Chris if it's okay if we open up the altars this morning. In the uncertainty of the world we live in, there's very few things we can count on. But I can promise you one thing. Jesus, you can count on. The first thing that we want to pray for this morning is there's anyone under the sound of my voice that you've never surrendered your life, repented of your sins, and put your faith in Jesus Christ. You say, Brother Paul, what does that mean? That means you believe when I told you that Jesus died on that cross 2,000 years ago for your sins. That he took the punishment that you yourself deserve. And you put your faith in the finished work of the cross. And you call out upon him. He promises to forgive you of all unrighteousness. To save you for eternity. To be reconciled to him. This doesn't mean that every situation in your life is going to be fixed. I'd be lying to you if I said everything's just going to be wonderful and peachy. In fact, the truth is, it might get worse. But that doesn't mean that his love is not true to you. That doesn't mean that what he did on the cross is nullified because your situation isn't good. Because that cross is what dictates his love for each one of you. And if you've never received that love, I want to give you an open invitation. If that is you, if you could just slip up your hand. I'm not doing this to embarrass you. 
I just would be an unfaithful minister if I didn't give you an opportunity to receive Jesus and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's anybody here you've never, you've never repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ, just slip up your hand. Don't let the moment pass by. Tomorrow is not promised. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The second thing I want to do this morning is I want to pray for those that are in day two. And you're weary and you're tired. You're having trouble believing that God loves you through this present circumstance. You're having trouble waiting for His timing. Maybe you're having trouble believing that He really is going to call your name for His glory's sake. If that's you today, I want to open up the altars for prayer. We're going to take a moment and the worship team will minister. If that's you, you just need to slip out of your seat and come up here. We're going to pray. I'm going to ask Pastor Chris to help me. We're going to lay hands on people this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for your people, Lord God. Thank you for your people, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord. We, we thank you for your truth, Lord. Lord, I've done what you've asked me to do. Now, Lord, do what only you could do. I, I could go no further, Lord. By the power and the might of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Holy Spirit, do what you can do, Lord. Do what you can do and only you can do, Lord. Oh, the disciples could have moved a rock away from a grave, but they couldn't call the dead to life. Lord, I'll move a rock away from the grave, but only you can call them to life. And I pray in Jesus' name, Lord God, that your anointing will be poured over this congregation right now, specifically every person that has answered this call, Father. I pray for Holy Ghost and fire to be poured out today, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord. I pray for healing to be poured out in the name of Jesus, whether mental, emotional, physical, relational, Lord, in the name of Jesus, for by the might and the power of your Holy Ghost, Lord Jesus. Do what only you can do, Lord. Do what you can do, Lord. Do what only you can do. We're calling upon you, my Lord. We're calling upon you, Lord. Have your way in this place, my God. Have your way in this place, my Lord. Jesus' name, Jesus' name, Jesus' name.
Come on, who's so grateful for the ministry of Brooklyn Teen Challenge? Amen. We want to just thank Pastor Paul and his beautiful wife, Ashley, and the men for coming out here with, with us this morning. We're so honored that you guys are here. This ministry is so special to my heart. I grew up around this ministry from the day I was born. My father served faithfully for many, many, many years, 25 years. And I grew up around these men every single day of my life. And I am so blessed by your testimonies, by what God's doing in your life. And it just shows the power of Jesus Christ. I mean, I remember being a little kid, just seeing all these different men come in from all different stages of life. And their lives are getting radically changed by the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're seeing it on display again today. So we're just so grateful to the Lord. Amen. For what he's doing. And their family to us. And before we leave this morning, before we close and go our separate ways, we want to do something very special. We want to really pour in to this ministry. So I'm going to have my ushers come forward at this time. And if you feel led before we, we close, we want to just give up a special offering towards this ministry financially. They do so much fundraising. They go to different churches all over the state. And when you look at these testimonies that we heard this morning and you see these men, everything that we're, that we're going to give this morning is going towards them. Curriculum, housing, that we can get even more beds, so we can get, fit even more guys in that, in that, in that house. So we want to just pray this offering. And if you feel led at this time, when we close, just come down these center aisles and just give um, whatever you feel led to give towards this amazing ministry. Amen. And when, after we pray, please don't sneak out. We have so much um, fellowship, food, refreshments downstairs as well that we want to invite you to gather and just hang with us for a little bit. And uh, as Jeremiah shared this morning, there's so much that goes on throughout the week as well here at the church. So we encourage you to go to www.compasschurchli.com and to get connected. Bible studies, women's group, prayer, men's Bible study, young adult. There's so much that goes on. So we encourage you to do that. But let's just pray. Lord, we thank you for this amazing ministry, God. We thank you for the work, God, that you are doing, God. These guys are living proof of your power, God, of your healing, miraculous power, Father God, that you have the ability, God, to heal and to change lives, Father Father God, so I pray, Lord, that this service from the word, the incredible word that Pastor Paul gave under the anointing of your Holy Spirit, God, from, from the testimonies that we heard, from the songs that we heard, God, God, that you just start to, to shift and move in the hearts of your people, God. God, you just, maybe there's someone that's in here battling. If you're real, if this is all true, God, we saw living proof this morning. So we want to just give, Father God, to this amazing ministry, Lord. So I just pray over this offering that we're going to collect for them, God. God, that you just multiply, Father God. This ministry, God, is doing so much for this hurting and this broken world that is bound by addictions, down by depression and anxieties and everything that comes from the pit of hell, God. So, Lord, we just pray that you just bless them. You bless this ministry, the leadership, Father God, every single person that you draw to this ministry of Brooklyn Teen Challenge, God that you just change hearts, you change lives for your glory, for the advancement of your kingdom, that your kingdom can be advanced and that lost people in this world can hear the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. We bless your name for the rest of our days. You get all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Just a quick note, if you are writing a check, make it out to Compass Church. Just please put in the memo, uh, Brooklyn Teen Challenge, so we can uh, just write them one check and bless them. Guys, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Uh, you can come. The offering has been prayed for, so you can come and give. And don't forget, we got some refreshments downstairs. We'll see you downstairs. God bless.
Hello? Hello? We will have our breeders meeting in about five minutes up in the front here. All of our breeders, we need to come to the front of the sanctuary for our meeting in about five minutes. For all breeders, we are going to be starting our meeting in about five minutes. If you need to use the restroom and get a drink and come back up to the front. <laughs>